Welcome back for our final discussion of Texas under Spanish rule. And in today's lecture, we're going to look at the period from 1779, just a few years after the United States declared independence from Britain, until 1821, when at the end of the lecture today, you'll see that Spain signs an agreement with rebels and Spain ceases to control the country of Mexico and, of course, Texas, which was in Spain, became part of uh, Mexico. So it's the period 1779 to 1821. And in the next lecture, we'll look at Texas under control of Mexico for a short period until Texas had... Uh, in a war of independence from Mexico and became, of course, its own country before joining the United States. So this lecture deals with Spanish Texas in the age of revolutions. And by revolutions here, we're talking primarily about the American Revolution and then the French Revolution, which had a major impact on developments in Europe, which I will go over in very general terms. Now let's look first of all at the state in the context of the American Revolution. <clears throat> Spanish t Texas really played a minimal role in the American Revolution. The Spanish joined the French in fighting the English uh, in the American Revolution, but Spain joined the war effort late in the game and unlike France never sent active military troops nor to the east coast the Spanish did fight the English along the Gulf Coast and Spain's Texas's major contribution of course part of the Spanish Empire was to uh, provide cattle which were driven by the early cowboys or what we so we call vaqueros from Texas to the Louisiana area um, for food for the Spanish troops who were fighting the, the English along the Gulf Coast. And most Texans themselves played no real role in supporting the American Revolution. Now at this time, there was the first real census of Spanish Texas and it showed there were fewer than 3,000 residents in the settlements set up by Spain. These were the small towns or missions. About half of these 3,000 claimed that they were of Spanish origin, and roughly another half were Native American or Indian residents of the missions, and also, there were mixed people, mixed race people, who had a combination of Spanish, Indian, and perhaps African heritage. Now, there are two terms you need to be familiar with. You may have already heard of mestizo. A person is considered mestizo if they're of Spanish and Indian uh, parentage. And a mulatto is a person of Spanish and African heritage. This first census showed there were only 20 slaves in what is now Texas, most of whom were of African descent. However, a few were Indians. Now, outside of the Spanish settlements, there were around 20,000 Indians. They didn't do a precise count. This was more of an estimate. So you can see at the time of the first census with the roughly 20,000 Indians living outside the Spanish settlements, the vast majority of inhabitants of the state, of what's now the state, were, um, were Indians. Now, the industry which, for which Texas became famous, and we'll look at a lot over the course, of cattle and horse ranching really started during the 1700s, 
and it was really concentrated around the Spanish population centers at San, Ando San Antonio, Nagadoches in eastern Texas, and the Rio Grande River Valley in the south. There was really no large-scale agriculture at that time in the state because most of the state is very arid. So most of the agriculture was largely at the subsistence level. So people basically, families or whatnot, grew enough to eat themselves a slight surplus of crops that they could sell to purchase items that they could not uh, produce themselves on their farms. Because the population was very low and spread out, there were very limited opportunities in Texas for merchants to set up stores, to do trading, for skilled craftsmen such as carpenters or common laborers. And really the only way to become wealthy at this time was to engage in ranching. Now the first ranches were set up after the Spanish gave large grants of land to people with political connections either in Spain or with the people, the Spaniards running uh, Mexico. And this led to the emergence of ranchos, uh, which, which means a fairly large ranch. And here the landholders really had great power. They had virtual autonomy or independence over what happened on their land as well as how they treated their workers. Now, because there were so many cows and horses running around uh, because there, there weren't really any fences, the law required that all cattle had to be branded. And, and if it wasn't branded, it automatically became property of the Spanish king. And this led to the development of the cowboy skills of rounding up the cattle roping them because they'd have to rope them and you can see this in a rodeo you go to the houston rodeo or some other rodeo the cowboys this was their day-to-day -day work they would rope they would herd the cattle rope them and they'd put the ropes um, such that they could tie their feet flip them over not hurting them and taking a red hot branding iron to put a brand on them and this, by the way, is still required in the state of Texas. If there's cattle without any brands, um, you, you cannot claim ownership. <clears throat> now, at this time, the transportation in Texas was primitive at best, as the, was the communications. Uh, in 1779, a, a postal system was set up where you could take a letter or a small package and send it to another point on the road system. And there was a system of roads, most of which were not paved with, with stones or gravel or anything, but they were connected between the missions and the towns in a very extensive network called El Camino Real, or it means the Royal Highway or by royal, it's referring to the King of England. So it was, you know, best, probably translated best as the King's Highway. And here I have a few maps to, just to show you how extensive it was. Now, this is the system of the Camino Real in Mexico. And the Spaniards set up similar systems uh, further south in, in the, the Spanish Empire in this hemisphere. So you can see at the southern part, you have Mexico City which of course was a very large city. It had about 150,000 inhabitants and the road went north to Zacatecas. Between Mexico City and Zacatecas, you had some of the wealthiest silver mines such as um, in the city of Guanajuato. And then the road went to Zacatecas, another very wealthy, wealthy uh, mining area. And then to the west, or your, it went up to Durango, and then branched and went up to Hermosillo, and then up into what's now the state of California. You have San Diego, Los Angeles, 
and San Francisco. And of course, you look at the names today of those cities, you know, Anglos pronounce them as San Diego, Los Angeles, and San Francisco. Of course, the city of Los Angeles is Los Angeles. And what does that mean? The angels. And I remember when I first went to live in Mexico, uh, speaking Spanish with some Mexicans in Mexico City, and they told me they were going to take their next trip to Los Angeles. And I had to think of it. Oh, yeah, that's Los Angeles. Okay. Then from Durango, we also have, in the going almost directly north, another major branch of the El Camino Real or the Royal Highway, Chihuahua, and then into what's now then El Paso, which is in Texas, right at the western edge of Texas, as you know. And then it went almost due north to Santa Fe, New Mexico. And New Mexico was of great importance to the Spaniards. And we'll see a little more about that in a minute because it's just west of um, Texas. And there was much more Spanish interest in New Mexico than Texas. Then finally, if we look at Zacatecas, going to the northeast, we see the road comes up and essentially goes to San Antonio, Austin, and over into uh, a bit into the current state of Louisiana. Let's look at a close-up of the Camino Real in Texas. Okay, here we are. <clears throat> you can see San Antonio was a major hub, and then it went up through San Marcos, Austin, Nagadoches in eastern Texas, and off into Louisiana. Uh, there was no Roy Royal Road. The southern Gulf Coast, for instance, Corpus Christi or Houston, nor going further north to Waco or Dallas, which is just off the top of this map. <clears throat> and if you actually, there's a video in uh, the module on a couple of videos on the Camino Real, and there's one on in, in Texas. And many places there'll be you'll you'll see road signs or signs along roads in Texas, uh, New Mexico, California, or in Mexico itself. Uh, saying the Camino Real passed right through here, right through here. <clears throat> okay, let's look at the situation in Spain, because obviously the Spanish Empire in, Western, in the Western Hemisphere was greatly impacted by what happened in Spain. Now, you probably recall from other general history courses that Muslim invaders had taken over Spain around the year 700 and remained there until 1492, at which time the last of the Muslim invaders was pushed out of Spain by Spanish soldiers. The Spanish call, called them Moros. Um, and so for 700 years, um, Islamic inhabitants populated or ran uh, Spain, and in fact, some of the best preserved um, mosques uh, from a thousand years ago are in, in Spain, in places like uh, uh, the Cord Cordoba in the Sevilla, Sevilla area in southern Spain. So anyway, in 1492, which by coincidence was the year, of course, that Christopher Columbus landed in the Western Hemisphere, the Spanish finally pushed the Muslim invaders out of um, Spain. And obviously for the Spaniards and the Spanish government, this was a major accomplishment. And as a result of this, sort of a reaction to having 700 years of Muslim rule, the Spanish government decided to give women, Spanish women, many more rights than women had in other European countries. And this was extended, of course, in New Spain or the Spanish colonies in the Western Hemisphere. And one of the most significant rights was women enjoyed separate and community property in marriages. What does that mean? If a separate property, if a woman had property before she got married, she retained that property in her name <clears throat> 
during the marriage. Community property, which is, is still the law in the state of Texas and many, but not all states, the United States means any property acquired during the marriage by either the man or the woman became joint property. And this was very important because if the man were to die and often died before the wife, the wife could enjoy that property. <clears throat> the women didn't have full equality under the law, but in Texas, they did play significant roles in managing the ranches um, and the men themselves were often out on horseback on the ranches, you know, driving the cattle or they engaged in warfare with the Indians or the men were very, very engaged in politics. Of course, at this time, women did not engage in, could, could not engage in politics. <clears throat> and even though the Spanish origin men and women living in Texas generally had very low levels of education, very low levels of literacy, because they were living on the very frontier of the Spanish empire. They really defended the rights that they had as Spanish people. And again, we've seen in the previous lecture, Texas was on the very fringe of the Spanish empire in the Western hemisphere. And because no mineral wealth was found there, like gold or silver, there really wasn't a lot of interest in Texas. So the people who went there were really going to the frontier. Now let's look briefly at the Indians in Texas during the age of revolutions. And of course, when we say in Texas, we mean the geographic area that now comprises the state of Texas. You still had continuing conflict between the Indians and the Spanish uh, settlers. And in general terms, that tended to limit the economic development of, of Texas. And the major conflicts were with the Carancawa in the south, the Comanches and the Apaches. And those continued until the late 1700s. Now the Spanish, as I mentioned before, were more interested at this point in New Mexico than uh, Texas. And so the Spanish military succeeded in pushing many of the Comanche and Apache from New Mexico. And that tended to push them in into Texas. And finally in 1785, uh, the Spanish government managed to uh, reach a, a peace agreement with the Comanches, and this peace agreement lasted some 40 years. <clears throat> We've already seen this map in the previous lecture, but just to remind you of the huge area that the Comanches um, controlled during the 1800s, you can see it's it runs sort of on the map, the dots are uh, major cities, but at the, the southern part there, you have San Antonio, Austin, moving up, you know, almost to Dallas, all the way up half of Oklahoma, Kansas, and coming around, and some of the panhandle. That area was virtually totally controlled by the Comanche until the late 1800s, and even the U.S. Army uh, was not successful in defeating them at first. Now this is a, a Spanish drawing of Comanches uh, before they got firearms and you can see the horsemen and as I mentioned in the previous lecture the Comanches were real experts uh, with horses particularly fighting from the horses. During this 40-year period when the peace treaty with the Comanches um, was working, the Spanish joined with the Comanche uh, warriors to fight against the Apaches.
I spoke extensively in the last lecture about the mission system that was set up, and you'll recall it was set up for three purposes. One was, as the name suggests, to bring Christianity to the Indians. The second was to make the Indians, uh, give the Indians a skill or a trade where they could become Spanish subjects and therefore pay taxes. And the third was to teach the Indians Spanish. And of course, they were all connected because the Indians didn't speak Spanish. There was no way the priests could con convert them or they could teach them practical skills. Well, the, mission did, the missions were largely a failure except in the San Antonio area. The, um, the missions that continued among the coastal Indians um, because they, some of them were very poor and they went to live in the missions basically because they got food uh, and also with the, the, the Indian group, the Kwawitakans in the San Antonio area. And again, they were very, very poor, like the coastal Indians, and they welcomed the food and, and you know, the opportunity to, to learn how to make a living. But as I saw previously, the missions failed miserably with the Caddo in East Texas. And in fact, for several years, the priests were only able to convert one or two Indians. And they also failed with the Apaches. The Franciscan priests never even considered setting up missions for the Comanche Indians or the Wichitas in uh, northern Texas because they viewed them uh, as too nomadic. It would be too hard, just simply too hard to deal with them. So overall, the Franciscan priests by 1795 or 1800 were just very, very frustrated with working in Texas. And you've got to remember, these are very devout people who essentially want to, you know, their life goal is to convert the Indians. And of course, they were working closely with the Spanish government and Spanish military in this effort. So the priests were frustrated and they wanted to move to California because they had heard that the climate was much better there and that it was easier to convert the Indians, which it was. So the Franciscans turned over the missions and all the property associated with the missions. That includes not only the buildings, but many, many thousands of acres of land. That was turned over to the Spanish government, which actually redistributed that land to those Indians who had become baptized, or in other words, had become Christians. And this fulfilled one of the mission goals because those Indians could become taxpaying citizens of, of New Spain because with land, they could engage in agriculture. And as for the religious objective, well, the mission churches uh, largely stayed open for a number of years, and the religious aspects were taken over by priests, Spanish priests, who didn't belong to an order such as the Franciscans, the Jesuits, or the Dominicans. Now let's look at Spanish Texas in the context of the United States once the United States becomes independent. And Spain was very, very concerned about this because Spain was bordering the United States. And the U.S. population and general economy were growing much faster than uh, the Spanish population and economy in Mexico and Texas. And Spain was very concerned about Florida because it still controlled Florida, as well as the huge Louisiana territory in which very, very few Spanish uh, lived. Now this is going back to 1763 here. You recall this is the end of of the French and Indian War, which despite the name, of course, was not a war between the French and the Indians, but a war between the French and the British. And you can see in this map, the darker shaded area are the Spanish claims. So it's Mexico, 
to the South Central America, coming up all the way to the Mexi to um, the city of New Orleans and the Mississippi River. That vert sort of more or less vertical line there in the on the right side, the eastern side, is the Mississippi River and then comes up along other rivers. That was French Louisiana over there. And that was all controlled by Spain. To the east of that were the English claims. Now, Spain really wanted a large number of immigrants to come into these areas so they could claim that they were their areas. Um, and they so they had a very liberal or generous immigration policy. But part of that policy, and this is very important, is that all non-Spaniards and particularly Anglo-Americans who moved into Spanish territory had to become Spanish citizens or Spanish subjects and they had to become Roman Catholics. Now Anglo-Americans means now the United States is a country Americans of An Anglo-Saxon heritage and at that time what we're talking about essentially are Americans from British heritage or perhaps German Northern European um, heritage. So for them to come in, or any non-Spaniards, they had to be, swear allegiance to the Spanish king, renounce their U.S. citizenship, and become Roman Catholics. And we'll see Mexico adopts the same policy later in the next lecture when it invites Americans to come in and settle in Texas. Okay. Now, <clears throat> very early on, there were two people of, well, there were many Americans who moved into, not Texas right away, but the area, uh, the huge area called Louisiana. William Morgan moved near the Mississippi River in Spanish territory, and he founded what he called New Madrid. Madrid, of course, is the capital city of Spain. And he was able to attract Irish American Catholics because they were already Catholics, so that wasn't a problem becoming Catholics. And these Irish American Catholics were not particularly loyal to the United States because at that time in history, as you recall, um, Catholics in general and particularly Irish Catholics um, were discriminated against in many places in the United States. Another significant person was Moses Austin who moved into the what's now the state of Missouri in 1798 and that of course was part of the huge Louisiana era tor territory controlled by the Spanish. He moved there and he wanted to start mining for lead and he, in fact he was very successful became very wealthy because the lead was used at that time to manufacture ammunition, you know, the lead balls they would shoot out of uh, muskets and, of course, later um, bullets. We'll see Moses Austin later move to Texas with his family and, of course, the capital city of the state of Texas is named after him and his son, but we'll see that in subsequent lectures. <coughs> Now, returning to the European continent for a moment. In the 1790s, you'll recall, after, several years after the American Revolution, there was the famous French Revolution in which the king and queen literally lost their heads in a guillotine, and the effort was to overthrow the, the monarchy, the aristocratic government, and replace it with a government more responsive to the people. Now, Spain had a king at this time, Britain had a king, and Prussia, which was a state with a, a king, it later became part of Germany, those three countries got together to try and reverse the French Revolution because they were horrified that a fellow king 
had been overthrown and killed by what they viewed as an unruly mob. Well, what happened was, because of this, the French, now contr controlled by uh, the revolutionaries who succeeded, can, started to attack Spain until the Spanish government in Madrid collapsed. <clears throat> now, Spain again was really concerned about the United States and the Mississippi River was the border between the United States and Spanish Louisiana. The United States wanted to have free commerce along the Mississippi River because as you recall from your general course in U.S. history, the Central Plains area of the United States, the real breadbasket of the United States at that time, states like Ohio and Illinois and Indiana, their agricultural pro pro uh, products would come down the Ohio River, then down the Mississippi River, float down the Mississippi River, go to the port of New Orleans, then put on ships which would take the food to the east coast of the United States because the transportation system was so poor in the United States it was much cheaper and faster to do that than try and transport the products uh, overland because of course there were no railroads yet and there were no rivers going in the correct direction and you have the Appalachian Mountains. So at first Spain controlled the port of New Orleans and it charged a fee for any U.S. vessels coming down the Mississippi River. But the Americans weren't happy and Spain was worried about a war over this. So Spain agreed that the United States could navigate the Mississippi River and they hoped that that would prevent the United States from perhaps joining the British to take over uh, the Mississippi River Valley. Well, allowing that navigation in the Mississippi River greatly increased uh, the value of all the farmland on the American side. So the American growth increased on both the American side and in Spanish Louisiana, just across the river, because there were really no Spanish there to control it. And so Americans just went there. It was very good farmland. Now we have, we'll talk briefly about Philip Nolan. He was a U.S. citizen um, who lived in uh, Louisiana, which remember was the, the territory was part of Spain. And he would, he and a few men would go into Texas to capture wild Texas horses. Because again, there were tens of thousands of horses running wild and, you know, surviving just fine uh, with the natural vegetation. He would capture them and take them back to markets in Louisiana area. And he would also sell those horses to the Caddo, despite the Spanish prohibition. Well, after a certain point, the Spanish said they were no longer going to agree to this. And uh, Philip Nolan and his men were arrested in Texas. They were taken to Mexico City and many of them were executed because they refused to follow the Spanish command to stay out of Texas. And why does Spain have this strong response? Well, they were really afraid of American expansion into um, Spanish lands. Texas, but also the rest of Spanish Louisiana. And you'll remember at this time in the U.S. history, this is in the early years of the uh, American Republic, that there was a real sense of manifest destiny. Many, many Americans strongly believed that the United States, according to God, God's plan was supposed to move out and take over the entire continent. And of course, the Spanish had heard of this and that you know, really upset them because they controlled an area which was actually larger than the United States at the time. Spanish Louisiana. Now this is a, a drawing of one of um, Nolan's accomplices, 
uh, Peter Bean, who went with Nolan on their last expedition to catch horses. He um, had a, survived the battle with the Spanish soldiers, and but then eventually went and spent seven years in Mexico in prison. And everything we really know about Nolan and all his raids and adventures comes from the memoirs that Mr. Bean wrote. Okay, we have to return briefly to developments in Europe because obviously they have a major bearing on what's happening in North America. So following the French Revolution, in the, it started in 1789, and next few years there was total turmoil, the king and queen of France, and many thousands of aristocrats were killed literally taken out in public, and the guillotine chopped off their head uh, in this central part of Paris, which is now called Place de la Concorde. Um, well, then there was a reaction and sort of a very conservative uh, government took over after a few years, and this was Napoleon Bonaparte who took over uh, France in 1799 and declared himself emperor. Well, for a number of reasons I won't get into in European politics, at this point, um, Spain decided to return the huge area of Louisiana to France because Spain was essentially petrified that Napoleon Bonaparte and his huge army would come and take over Spain. And we'll see they did that a few years later. So anyway, in 1799, the large area of Louisiana goes back to France. But just four years later, in 1803, France desperately needed money. And the United States had wanted to purchase from France the area around New Orleans to guarantee free access to the port of New Orleans they sent a delegate, the United States sent a delegation to Paris with instructions to spend so much money just to buy the area around New Orleans. And the French said, well, you know, you could have all of the Louisiana territory. Now, this is an area about the size of the United States at the time for just a little more. So the entire Louisiana territory was sold to the United States. And just as a side note, why did France need money in 1803? Well, in that very year, one of France's most valuable uh, possessions in the Western Hemisphere, the island that we now call Haiti, that, that island, uh, there was a major revolt by the slaves. There were very few Frenchmen who lived there it was so hot and humid, so many tropical diseases. And so the island was, I think, 90 or 95 percent slave. And the slaves got together, organized, um, killed a number of French and the other French left. And the net result was um, Haiti became an independent country in 1803. Uh, and of course, has remained independent to this very day. But that's the reason France needed the money to try and take back Haiti, which it didn't. So let's look at this map. In the center, the purplish color is the Louisiana Purchase. This is the huge area that the United States purchased from France. And look at the size of that. It's as large as the green area, which was the United States. It goes all the way, you can see New Orleans in the south, all the way up into, into Canada. And it goes, looking on the west, it goes into what's now West Texas, excuse me, East Texas. It goes across much of what's now um, the Panhandle area. I mean, many states in there, you know, Kansas, Nebraska, all of them were part of the Louisiana Purchase goes over into New Mexico, which was part of Spain, uh, and it goes up into the Rocky Mountains. So it was a huge, huge area. Now that area, again, 
previously had been Spanish. And then in 1799, the Spanish had given it to France. And now France has turned around and sold it to the United States. So the Spanish are a little worried here. They have, the United States has just doubled the, the territory that it controls. And it's pushing even further into New Spain. It's up right up to Nacogdoches. You can see San Antonio's, well, still pretty far away, but right up almost to Santa Fe. And Santa Fe was a major uh, Spanish outpost. So now Texas once again becomes a buffer. Now it's a buffer between Spain and the United States. And Spain really disputed the barrier here. Like where was the barrier between the Louisiana Territory and New Spain? Because it had not been well mapped. Um, and so uh, President uh, excuse me, Thomas Jefferson of the United States had sent a military expedition to the area to scout it out. The Spanish heard about that and they were terrified. And also you can see the Red River there uh, in the southern part of Louisiana Purchase. Well, the Americans had sent a military expedition up that river and they got up five or 600 miles and the Spanish went over and forced them to retreat. So now the Spanish are very, very concerned about the United States, which is ideologically talking about its manifest destiny to take over the whole continent. It's just doubled in size and it's pushed in to um, land very, very important to Spain. Okay, this is just what I mentioned uh, looking at the map. <clears throat> well, in an effort to reduce hostilities, particularly on the border between the current state of Louisiana and Texas, the, the Spanish and American military commanders in the area uh, decided to sign an agreement called the Neutral Ground Agreement where they created a, a, a buffer zone where, between Texas and Louisiana and they said no military troops will be allowed there. <clears throat> and this is a modern map of Louisiana and Texas. You'll be at the yellow area is the buffer zone. <clears throat> Since no military troops were allowed there, it became a refuge for criminals and other outlaws because they could just basically go there and no one was going to track them down. But it served as purpose of not having constant battle warfare. <clears throat> now the Spanish became even more concerned when the United States started sending organized expeditions into their huge Louisiana Purchase because the United States wanted to find out essentially what they had purchased. And the United States was still looking for a river route to cross the continent to reach the uh, riches of Asia. You will recall, of course, Christopher Columbus's voyage was not to reach the Western Hemisphere because Europeans didn't even know it existed at that time. He had hoped to sail across the Atlantic and reach um, the riches of China. And so f here we are hundreds of years after that and the Americans are still trying to find that magic river route across the continent where they can um, could sail large vessels and reach um, India. But the net effect of the, this expedition, the Lewis and Clark, which we have on the next map, uh, it extended effective American control far into the West. <clears throat> so this is uh, the route of the Lewis and Clark expedition. You can see the huge area in the middle of the map. As I mentioned, that's the Louisiana Purchase. So what they did is they traveled the red lines, sort of they started near Washington, D.C., and they took the Ohio River, and then they went north 
west along the Mississippi River to St. Louis, Missouri. You can see right in the middle of the map. And now they're at the edge of Louisiana Territory. And they kind of wanted to see where the rivers went. So they went on these rivers. So they went on rivers in a northeasterly direction. And they did very detailed maps. And <clears throat> what they found is there were no deep rivers. So you could forget trying to sail across to China. But they continued their exploration and they moved up. Many times they had like big canoes. They had to get, take them out and carry them two or three miles around waterfalls and whatnot. And they went up and at the very northern part there up in uh, North Dakota, they had to spend the winter. They had very friendly relations with the Indians. And actually they would have all, Lewis and Clark and all the white men, the Anglo men would have died if the Indians hadn't taken them, in, taken them into their homes, uh, provided them food. And you could read the journals of Lewis and Clark. They had very good relations with the Indians the whole way. And then they finally, finally, finally made it over to the state of Oregon. And they arrived there one week after the, a ship had been sent from the East Coast all the way around South America to pick them up and bring them back. But the ship had waited and left. And so they were told, sorry, the ship has left. They had no way to communicate back to the East Coast to tell them they had arrived. People in the East sort of assumed they died. They'd been gone so long. So what did they have to do? They had to make the return journey all the way back. You know, obviously in those days, they, uh, they had no telegraph or uh, any means of communicating that they were there and they wanted the ship to pick them up. <clears throat> well, there was another uh, expedition a little further south in the Rocky Mountains headed by Zebulon Pike. And this was a U.S. military expedition to explore the area and map it. And this really upset the Spanish because it started going through the heart of the Spanish area. Uh, this is a map of uh, Pike's expedition. And you can see it went started in St. Louis, Missouri. It went west. It went into, you can see Pike's Peak. That's in the state of Colorado. Very, very tall mountain. Went down into Pueblo and Santa Fe, New Mexico, which of course was a major Spanish outpost. It was American military mapping expedition. So the military didn't come in trying to take over these areas. But you can imagine how upset the Spanish were. And then they went south. Uh, into Chihuahua, which is in the current country of Mexico. And then you can see they went to San Antonio uh, and Nagadoches. And, uh, and so this, the net effect of this was the Spanish were more and more concerned about the Americans. <clears throat> so now let's talk, we're talking about the age revolutions. We talked about the American Revolution, the French Revolution. And now we're going to mentioned the Mexican Revolution. This is a revolution internal in Mexico uh, that led to the independence of Mexico in 1821. So now Spain is looks at Texas again as a buffer state, a buffer state between the Spanish Empire, particularly in Mexico, and the Americans. And, you know, Lewis and Clark are, make, are moving out west. The Pike expedition actually went in to Spanish territory. And so Spain really, really wanted more people living, more Spanish people or European people living in Texas to, um, uh, and also so they thought, you know, people could make money trading with the Indians, agriculture, whatever. Well, the problem for the Spanish is virtually no one from Spain wanted to cross the Atlantic and go up into Texas. They basically, you know, they might go to Mexico and stay in Mexico City, which was a very large city. Many, many wealthy Spaniards live there. And if you ever have been to Mexico City or have a chance to go, I think you'll be very, very impressed 
with the residences that the Spaniards lived in, the, uh, the standard of living there was very high. And the Spanish living in New Spain, and many of them had been in New Spain for generations because Spain, Spain had been controlling the area for so long, they didn't want to move up to the um, uh, Texas, Louisiana area, <clears throat> primarily Louisiana. They, so the only alternative, <clears throat> excuse me, was Spain said they would welcome Anglo-Americans from either the United States itself or from the area which the United States had purchased from France and of course that was formerly Spanish Louisiana, they would welcome them to move back into that huge Louisiana area just to have it more populated. But at first they did not welcome these Anglo immigrants coming to Texas. I'll return briefly here to Europe. <clears throat> well, in 1808, France under Napoleon invaded and occupied Spain. So now Spain is fighting for its life as a country. And so the Spanish government and the military obviously were more concerned about what was happening in Spain than what was happening in the Spanish empire in the Western hemisphere. So this gave a real opportunity to people in the Western hemisphere who wanted to become, have a war of independence and become independent from Spain. <clears throat> now, there are two groups of Spanish living in the Western Hemisphere, including Mexico. You had the Peninsulares, which means they were born in Spain. Peninsulares, you can see the word we use, peninsula, in there. And peninsula is what descri describes the geography of Spain. If you look at a map of Europe, Spain and Portugal are a peninsula sticking out from south, what's that, southwestern Europe, you know, connected to France. So peninsulares were those born in Spain. They believed that they were culturally superior to the Spanish who had been born in the Spanish colonies the Criollos. So a Criollo is a Spaniard whose parents are Spanish, but the, that person was born in Mexico or you know, somewhere in the Spanish colonies. Well, they competed and they both claimed that they were loyal to King Ferdinand VII, who was the Spanish king who'd been thrown out by the French when they took over because they wanted to legitimize their claims to political and economic power in New Spain. So because of the problems in Spain after the French invasion, you start to have this unrest between groups of Spaniards in the Western Hemisphere. And we'll see this leads to the independence of Mexico because there are many, many more Criollos or people born in the Spanish colonies than there are people who were born in Spain and went there. <clears throat> well, before we finish, get to the Mexican Revolution, let's look quickly at the boundary between Spain and the United States. Well, that was settled in 1819 in the famous adams onus Treaty. Those are the people from the United States and Spain who signed it. It's also called the Transcontinental Treaty. So Spain um, <clears throat> gave Florida to the United States in return for $45 million payment because the United States very much wanted Florida. Spain hadn't really colonized it much. But of most importance, this treaty decided on the boundaries between New Spain for the Spanish colony of Mexico and the United States. I'll do this last point in a minute. Let's look here at the map. So here we have, you can see in purple, the Spanish possessions and in green, the United States. 
uh, west of the Mississippi River, you have states. To the left of the Mississippi River, you have territories, U.S. territories. And of course, as you learned in U.S. history, those were carved up into states. So the dividing line is in red there. You know, you see it goes up, up the, the Sabin River, and then it goes north. Then it goes along the Red River in northern Texas. Then at a certain point, it goes straight north. Then it goes along the Arkansas River. And at a certain point in the treaty, it goes north. And then it runs due west on the 42nd parallel of uh, latitude. So you don't have to remember what you know, the 42nd parallel or anything, but those were, you know, they used rivers and parallels. It was pretty easy to survey latitude at that time. So this is the boundary now of the Spanish possessions. And you can see there just to the west of the Sabin River, that is Texas, okay? And Texas goes down to, of course, the Rio Grande River, which you can see there in blue. You can see the famous shape of Texas with Big Bend there. One element of the treaty that was very important for Spain was the United States promised it would never move west of that line. It would never move into the Spanish possessions of, um, you know, like Cal with California, Texas, etc. Now, the Spanish liked that. They had it in a treaty. And the Southerners in the United States were outraged. Why? 1819. Slavery was really at its peak in the southern part of the United States. Just the last 20 years, southern cotton pl plantations have become very profitable and they use an extensive number of slaves. And, you, and the southern slaveholders very much wanted new land and they wanted to move west. And this, of course, is much of the history of, of southern slavery in the 1800s in the United States. And because particularly the production of cotton wears out the soil. This is back before they had modern farming techniques with fertilizers and they didn't know how to properly plow the fields and irrigate the fields to keep the soil fertile. So they needed to keep moving. And here's the United States promising in an international treaty to Spain that the United States will not move beyond, west beyond that line. Now, the Spanish were very happy. And of course, we'll see how the United States took over all that territory later as a result of the war with Mexico in the 1840s. Okay, now let's go back to Mexican independence. Okay, back for the Mexican War for Independence. <clears throat> so we have in Spain, the Spanish government has been overthrown by the French. The Spanish military is weak. It's obviously much more concerned with what's happening in Spain than what's happening in a place like Mexico, even though Mexico has lots of gold and silver. Well, in 1810, in central Mexico, a priest, Father Miguel Hidalgo, issued the famous El Grito, which in Spanish means the scream or the call for reform. He was not calling for independence from Spain. He was saying the Spanish government needs to reform. And behind a lot of this was the dispute that I mentioned a few minutes before between the Crioles, those who were had Spaniards who had been born in uh, Mexico, and the Peninsulares, who were Spaniards who had been born in Spain. And the Peninsulares, they just felt that they were culturally elite, they were more educated. And this was sort of one of the root causes. Well, the Indians and Mestizos, and the Mestizos being part Indian and part Spanish, tended to have much darker skin than the Spaniards and felt discriminated against. They joined the movement demanding equal rights or egalitarian rights. And so now this political dispute became a social mass movement. 
So here we have Texas. Of course, this is the course in Texas. So what does this have to do with Texas? Well, Texas is the crossroads. It's right between the U.S. and New Spain. And it was an important location for both sides. Both the nationalists who supported remaining a Spanish colony and the, excuse me, the nationalists who supported now independence from Spain and the royalists or those loyal to the king who wanted to remain part of Spain. Uh, this map, uh, this is in Spanish. I just noticed a few minutes ago. This map <clears throat> uh, will basically show you the revolution. The Mexican War for Independence started in central Mexico there. You don't have to know where it says Dolores. It's called now Dolores de Hidalgo, after Hidalgo, in the state of Guanajuato. And the lines are sort of where the insurgents or rebels moved. And the dark shading is the extent of the insurgent or rebel movement. And you can see it went up into Texas, almost to Houston. So you had rebel activity coming into Texas with Spanish troops, we'll see in a minute, you know, um, battling with them in Texas. <clears throat> this is a painting from the time of Father Miguel Hidalgo. And you'll notice behind his desk is a painting of the patron saint of Mexico to this very day. And that is the Virgin of Guadalupe. And actually there is a large church, a basilica, for the Virgin of Guadalupe in Mexico City. And it's the second most visited site in the world for Catholics, the most visited site being uh, the Vatican um, in Italy. And actually, you can go in churches all over Latin America, and everyone I've been in, they have a, a painting of the, uh, the Virgin of Guadalupe, just like that one. Now, there were rebels. Now, remember, rebels are those fighting for independence, uh, such as Gutierrez, who went into Texas and, uh, and you know, and Texas was under Spanish control and then asked Americans in the Louisiana area to bring aid. Well, actually, Gutierrez's army uh, took over the cities of San Antonio and Nagadoches, took it over from the Spaniards. And his army consisted of Mexican rebels, American mercenaries. These were Americans who fought for money. Gutierrez would pay them money. And Indian allies. And Gutierrez made the mistake of when he captured uh, the the royalist or the Spanish administrators and military officers in Spain, he, rather than treating them as prisoners of war, he lined them all up and killed them. And this shocked the Americans. The Americans left and said, well, you know, that's not what's done among civilized people. And Gutierrez then declared that the area of Texas was independent from Spain. <clears throat> well, this didn't last very long. Uh, shortly thereafter, royalist forces or forces loyal, loyal to the King of Spain under Arredondo, they went into Texas and just really defeated the rebel forces at the Battle of Medina in 1813. So um, the rebels, or revolutionaries occupation of Texas didn't last very long. Now, this turned out to be the bloodiest battle ever in Texas history. The Spanish said, we're going to teach these rebels a lesson. And they just killed over a thousand rebels, many of whom had surrendered. They were just massacred. But the Spanish thought, well, they needed to teach them a lesson. <clears throat> well, so you have this major war going on in Mexico in many... And this led to a decline in the Spanish population in Texas because people, you know, didn't want to get involved in this. And most of Texas remained, you know, essentially without a government. And taking advantage of this, 
on the island of Galveston, a lot of rebels and pirates went there, and the pirates went out in their ship, ships and attacked other ships of the Gulf of Mexico and, and made a lot of money. So at this point, who's running Texas? Well, you don't really have the Spaniards there. The Spaniards from Spain, Spanish army is not really there. They just went in to get the rebels, then left. The Mexicans, the Spanish authorities in Mexico, they left. And so Texas was wide open for Americans to expand into Texas during this period. And we're almost here at the end. In 1819, uh, James Long, you can read a little more detail about this in the textbook. He led a group of American soldiers, Mexican rebels who had been exiled from Mexico, and the Lafitte brothers. And they had a raid, forget the word filibuster for a minute, they had a raid, they went into Texas and they raided it to establish an independent Texas. And they claimed that, well, what the, Mexico, the Spaniards called Texas was really part of Louisiana, the Louisiana Purchase, and should belong to the U.S. Well, Mr. Long was captured and killed by the Spanish. Now, he led what was called a filibuster raid. Now, what does that mean? Well, you'll hear on the news, filibuster is a, a procedure used in Washington or in, in, in the legislature, either in Austin or in... Um, Washington, D.C., to try and block legislation. But it also has another meaning, and it means, as I put here in red, an adventurer, not a soldier for a country, who undertakes a mission for personal gain. But his activities also advance the policy of a government, even though it's not associated with it formally. So James Long viewed himself as advancing the interests of the United States because if he has succeeded, then the area of Texas would then belong to the United States. The United States in Washington, they knew what he wanted to do. They kind of said, well, that'd be nice if he succeeds, but they did not support him. And he was there also for personal gain. <clears throat> so now... Anglo-Americans were moving into Spanish territory, not only in Louisiana, but to Texas, to get land for themselves. But their activity also aided the U.S. as part of the general belief at the time in manifest destiny. And as the Americans moved in, they took land previously claimed by the Spanish and later the Mexicans. And we'll see this point extensively in the next two lectures when we talk about Mexican rule of Texas. And then when we move into the Texas um, War for Independence um, and how you have this, you know, Spain and then Mexico invited Anglo-Americans in and then the Anglo-Americans, um, we'll see later, brought slaves in and it becomes a major controversy. Stay tuned for that. But meanwhile, back in Europe, the French were defeated in Spain. Remember, they had taken over Spain. Now they were pushed out of Spain. And, um, <clears throat> but it was now difficult for the Spanish to control colonies in the Western Hemisphere because they had so many efforts fighting the French and they had just taken control of their country again. So what happened, and I won't get involved in the long, complicated history of this, in 1821, the Spanish royalist forces, these are forces, lo military loyal to the Spanish uh, government, the king, and the rebels, or the revolutionaries in Mexico, signed the Treaty of Córdoba, which ended the war in Mexico and basically established the independent Catholic uh, country of Mexico. But here we see Vicente Guerrero, who was one of the rebels uh, who was signing that uh, treaty. He later became a Mexican president. 
So now Spanish Texas becomes Mexican Texas, and that's the subject of the next lecture. So we've talked about Spanish Texas, then Mexican Texas. Then we'll talk about the independent country of, te of Texas, the Republic of Texas. And then finally, we'll get to when Texas becomes a state of the United States. So remember I talked about in the introductory lecture, the six flags over Texas. Well, just here we've talked about Spanish Texas, Mexican Texas, independent Texas coming up, and then U.S. Texas. And then we have a couple more, French, and then under the Confederacy. Okay, let's look quickly at Spain's legacy in Texas. So Spain has now left Texas, the Spanish, to be taken over by Mexico, which we'll talk about in a minute. Well, the Spanish presence in Texas, along with the Mexican presence, but the Mexican presence didn't last very long, about 15 years before Texas became independent. It gave Texas a really distinct cultural heritage, and this far overshadowed the Indian culture, because of course, as we saw earlier in, the, in this course, the, the Indians had been there first. And now, cultural heritage, many, many aspects of this, and we'll be exploring some of these more later on. The language, well, Spanish, of course. The religion, Roman Catholics. Many of the institutions, and one of the institutions was Texas became a ranching center in North America. You had the tradition, while Spain controlled Texas, long before any Anglo-Americans set foot in Texas, of herding cattle from horse pack, using saddles on horses, herding them, <coughs> using ropes to rope them, to control them, <coughs> excuse me, the branding, the roundups, and even the famous cattle drives. Those all started in the 1700s, again, before any Anglo-Americans really entered Texas. We saw a few minutes ago, Spanish civil law was adopted in Texas, which gave greater property rights for women than was customary in English common law. And also, two aspects which live on to this very day in, in Texas. Spanish had homestead laws that gave greater protection to debtors for homes and a means of earning a living. What does that mean? If you start a business or you borrow too much and you go to court and you declare bankruptcy, okay, the judge will say, okay, Professor Glover, you made a lot of bad decisions. Your business you tried to set up was no good. Okay. They will then, the court will then say, okay, take your, we'll take your money you have in your bank and everything you have in your business and sell it to pay off the people who lent you money. But in Texas, they cannot force me to sell my home, my homestead. I need a place to live. It's not this way in all the U.S. states today. But in Texas, it is. And this is from this Spanish heritage. My home, this is where I live and my family lives. So that's sort of sacred. And the means of earning a living. Well, for me, I guess it would be my laptop computer. But if I were a car mechanic, I'd have a big, big tool chest full of tools, expensive tools. They, could, they cannot force me to sell those tools to pay off money I owe. Okay, so that's a real legacy from the Spanish, which continues to this very day. Another one has to do with the water law. And that's very, very important because Texas is a pretty dry state outside of East Texas. And so where do people get their river, their water? Well, either from rivers or they pump it from underground. But if water comes from a river, the law in Texas, still the law and started with Spain is that if you're going to use uh, water from the river, you just can't take it all for your farm because the people who also live downstream have a right to that water. So the water law emphasizes the community needs. And, you know, a simple example is I have my big ranch and this uh, big farms and ranch and this river's coming down. 
I just can't build a canal and take 99% of the water for my cows and for my, you know, I can have beautiful fountains and have, and all, all of you who live down river where you just get a trickle. No, and this is exactly the same thing today. And this actually started in ancient Rome with the aqueduct system and the Spanish picked it up because of course Spain was controlled by whom? The Romans for a long time. And so this comes from Roman law and that way we have that in Texas. Again, not all the U.S. has this. Okay, the first immigrants from the United States, we're almost done here. The first permanent settlements of Anglo-Americans in Texas was along the Red River in the north and the Nacogdoches area in the east. And these Anglos, uh, Anglo-Americans, started coming to Texas and telling the people back home, I've gone to Texas. And some would even write that, you know, put up a sign, I've gone to Texas. So that's where the phrase gone to Texas really started. And it will continue uh, in the course. And as for the Indians, a number of small groups of Indians, as well as the Cherokee, arrived in Texas just before Spanish authority collapsed. And one tribe is fairly significant, was over a thousand Alabama and Coshata Indians moved from Louisiana, they moved west to the area near Nagadoches. And this is now an Indian reservation. It's about an hour and a half drive from West Houston area where I live. And you drive up, it's up before Nagadoches. You get up in there and on the side of the road, there's a big sign, you know, Alabama and Coshata Indian Reservation. And, and as you drive in, it says you're now leaving the state of Texas and entering the nation state of the Alabama Coshata Indians because their reservation is not part of the state of Texas. They have their own police. They have their own tribal laws. Texas police cannot enter the state. Uh, the federal police can, like the FBI, only if there's a murder or something major. And actually I drove in there because I saw it and I just moved to Texas. I didn't know and I went in. They don't really, not many live in there. They have pretty little lakes and they've built cabins for tourists and they kind of run the area. And the Indian woman at the entrance was telling me they all live in neighboring towns outside the reservation. But if you look up that Indian tribe name on the internet, they have several big festivals every year and they welcome non-Indians to go and I've been meaning to do it and I've never done it. <laughs> I'm going to do it now. I'm thinking about it. Go there and they have, you know, food and dances and, you know, activities for kids and whatnot. It looks like it would be very, very interesting. And they talk about their culture. But that is one of only three existing Indian reservations in the state of Texas. And so that's a kind of a nice day trip. And finally, diversity in Texas greatly increased because now you have different groups of Native Americans or Indians moving in from elsewhere, as well as Anglo-Americans. And they joined the Indian tribes that had been here for a long time, as well as the Spanish Texans. Uh, and so we have now a much, much more diversity in the, in the state. And what we'll see is now Mexico controls Texas, and we'll find in the next lecture, over the next 10 or 15 years in the course, many, many more Anglo-Americans come to Texas after Mexico opens Texas to American settlement and with huge land grants. So people like Moses Austin will see, will come here because the Mexican government says, we want a population in Texas. We want a population in Texas that's not Indian because Mexico was very worried about the Comanches and other Indians. Remember the Comanches controlled all of central Texas. They were afraid they were gonna start moving south and attacking the rich silver mines in central, north central Mexico. And the next lecture we'll discuss, as I mentioned before, 
Mexican rule of Texas from 1821 until Texas becomes independent in 1835. Thank you very much.